getting some very good speakers and the key thing for any project of this kind is getting the momentum and keeping the momentum up. And somebody, we've got somebody special today who it's a great privilege to have and uh, is somebody who's a very good friend of ours and very committed to the region, very committed to one very important aspect of entrepreneurial development in the region. We've got with us Tony Berry from Mowgli and Tony's focus is on the vision around mentoring. In other words, the critical component of somebody who can take you through the different life stages of business. So welcome, Tony. Hi there, Ravis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and good seeing you again, as ever, <laughs> as it always is. Because obviously we've been talking for a while around your interest in the region, around your sense of entrepreneurship in the region, around your commitment already in your business activities. Do you want to talk a little bit to start with around what... What makes, what drives your commitment to the region? I have lived in the Middle East now for 45 years. And during that time, we set up approximately 14 businesses as an entrepreneur in the Middle East. And as a family, we've done really, really well from that process. Um, and we have noticed that entrepreneurs around the world have brought significant benefit to their society. As a result of that, I felt it compelled to try and help entrepreneurs within the Middle East. And what are the characteristics of the Middle East and entrepreneur that interest you, say, compared to anywhere else? I think the biggest characteristic which interested me was the fact that um, the Middle East has such a huge youth unemployment challenge. And as a result of that, the only potential solution to meeting that challenge is through entrepreneurship. And therefore, how can we champion that? How can we um, assist in that process? And we went through a, a whole process of finding out what we can add to value. And our final conclusion was that every entrepreneur should have a mentor. And as a result of your business success over those 40 plus years, um, what brought you to mentoring as the key critical piece that you thought was the missing link? I had the great pleasure of attending a session in Michigan University with a, a wonderful gentleman called C.K. Pralad, who wrote the book, The Fortune of the, of the Pyramid. And he led a session with me at Michigan Business School on what do entrepreneurs need today? And at that time, which was January 2007, entrepreneurs had capital, finance was not an issue, but what they really needed was their human capital developed. Um, and that's where the, the nub of the criticality came from. How can we give every entrepreneur a mentor to guide them through the process of startup growth and hopefully their success later on? And can you talk for a second about the mentors that you've had? Because I'm interested in, in, in obviously, as you are in the human aspect of it, because it's all about um, understanding the drivers and motivations and blockages that people have. Who are the people along the way that you can hold up as milestones in your evolution as an entrepreneur? I did an analysis a few weeks ago, which was to identify those mentors in my life who had helped me both in my personal journey as well as my business journey. And when we're born, we are born with the first mentors in our lives, which are our parents. So I had two critical issues when I was younger. The first one was when I had an operation on my tonsils and adenoids. They cut out part of my palate, and I couldn't speak properly. So for a period of about nine months, I had to have elocution lessons, and even today, my voice sometimes wavers as a result. So my parents were able to bring me through that. The, the second one, on a personal basis, was when I was 16, I had rheumatic fever, um, and I was hospitalized for nine months again. And that was a great period in my life, because prior to that, when I was 15, 16 years old, um, my focus in life was on two issues. One was sport and um, one was finding a, a girlfriend. And those two preoccupied me. And as a result of that, my age at that time, my results in academic were terrible. But lying in a bed for nine months, you learn how to become academic. And I learned how to work. So I learned from that process and I was supported fantastically by my parents, as well as my first, what I would call external mentor at that time, which was my chemistry teacher, who really, really helped me wrote up every week all my lessons, sent me every week in an envelope, every single lecture I had to have, and yeah, I learned fantastically. In the business side, I've been blessed with a whole stack of mentors as well. Do you want to talk about some of those? Um, 
The first one I can remember highlighting was in 1976 when I was given a staff appraisal, the like of which I, I haven't heard of anybody else being given one like it, which was, Tony, you are wasting your time in this company. We cannot consider you for promotion until you're 32. At that time, I was 24. I think you should leave the company. <laughs> but I think what you should do is do an MBA. So he backdated my leave application so I could go to business school to get interviewed. When I came back with a place at Manchester Business School, he also backdated my termination notice because I wouldn't be able to make the program on time to ensure that I went on to that um, MBA course, which was a major part of my life, learning about all aspects of business and being able to integrate the whole in one. So those were two specific ones. Fantastic. Yeah. And then what kind of businesses were you involved in afterwards? What have you been doing in the region? The first business, in fact, at Manchester Business School, I worked with a, a member of the royal family in Qatar to develop the first <coughs> engineering workshop in Masai and down in the south part of Qatar. Uh, unfortunately, when I joined the company, which was in 1978, the fundamental mistake was made in the marketing feasibility. So I arrived there with a wife, a three-year-old baby, um, to tell the investor that, in fact, his business would never work. So I was actually out on the street myself from a job after three months in Qatar. And he turned to me and said, Tony, thank you for that. Now let's set up a business together. So the first business I set up was a trading company in Qatar um, in 1979. We then set up a construction company, which was doing building and civil works. We then set up a mechanical construction company. We then set up an industrial service company. And, and the final one, which I enjoyed telling everyone, we set up an oil, field, an oil trading company. Um, on the back of the fact they built a refinery and we were then exporting all the product for them. And it just continued on and on from there. Fantastic. I'm not going to go through the wall because there's no, too, too, too many there. <laughs> That's a whole separate <laughs> webinar. That, we'll do that later. <laughs> so, okay, so fine. I mean, so mentoring has been central to you and it's, it's, it's kind of when you look at the story of entrepreneurs across, you know, the world, I think mentoring is, is there whether it's a, an entrepreneur, whether it's a sporting hero, mm -hmm. whether it's a politician, whether it's anybody looking for somebody to give them guidance in areas where they are not really able necessarily to find their way through. So what, what drew you to mentoring as in, you know, what are the characteristics of, of, a, of a good mentor? A, a good mentor is somebody who you have trust in. You, you can never have a mentor you don't trust. By the way, you can never have a mentor you don't either like or love either. So you have to have th those attributes. Um, a, a good mentor is a, lis a good listener. A good mentor does not tell you what you need to do. He will give you options and he'll give you perspective on those options. Um, a, a good mentor will look at you holistically as a person from a personal perspective and also from a business perspective. Um, but fundamentally, a, a good mentor always puts your interests at the center of whatever he gives you in terms of advice, i.e. his own interests are subservient to yours. And in this region, which we know to be one where the family unit is generally strong, mm -hmm. where you might often turn to a family member or a friend for mentoring, Talk a little bit about, if you can, Tony, about the necessity possibly to have somebody from outside that network uh, yeah. driving your mentoring. You're right to point out, in the, within the Middle East, it's usually the, the parents who become the first mentors, as they do in the, in, in the West. There's also a tribal connotation. This is particularly the case in certain countries where people get mentored within a, within a, a particular tribe. Um, but if I look back, there's two aspects I'd like to share with you. The first one is, uh, when I did the analysis a few months ago, I noticed that from 1978 to 1992, I never had a mentor. And if I cast my eyes back to those period of time, it was during that time when I had made the, the worst of my mistakes. Um, and today, I cast my mind back, 
I've had 14 mentors. Since 92? Since, no, over my lifetime. Of that 14 mentors, today I have six currently I'm involved with. These are friends, and they can also be family members. For example, my parents are now deceased, but my brother's a mentor to me. My biggest critic of anybody is my daughter. So within the family I get mentoring, and outside the family. And why is it so important to get an outside perspective? Is because they look at, let, let me back off slightly. A good mentor looks at an issue and provides you with alternative choices which you may not have considered as a solution to that particular problem in the first place. And secondly, he's able to look at those particular choices and give you different perspectives on those choices which allow you to evaluate them all. Within a family environment, quite often, there's a limitation on the choices given to you. And as a result of that, you don't have the possibilities of making different decisions. And when do we need a mentor most of all is when we're faced with a choice decision to make. Do we go this way? Do we go this way? That is the critical time. Maybe there's another op option which we've not considered. That's what a mentor comes to us for. And we're, talking, we're getting into an interesting area, which is the skills required of a mentor. Because, mm -hmm. of course, success uh, or knowledge are just, I guess, starting points in the mentor's capacity. What, what are the skills that a mentor needs to have? And let's talk a little bit about Mowgli's mm -hmm. interest in developing those skills, because that's core of the core yeah. of what you do. And maybe talk, if you can, about how you got into the idea of starting Mowgli. Okay. The, the mentors who we want to attract are people who have a business background, because they're, they're mentoring entrepreneurs. So they must understand something about business. So they have to have an understanding of what holistically a business is about, which means finance, marketing, operations, all those areas. Not necessarily in, in a deep skill basis, but have an understanding of how they're interrelated. They have to have a really good listening skills. And they have to have humility. So they can, as I said earlier, put the mentee's interests at the core and not their own interest. Um, we, when we look at it from Mowgli perspective, we again come from this holistic point of view, which means business and personal. We don't only give recommendation and advice as mentors on their business, because we believe you are all one. Um, so the ability for emotional intelligence to pick up on the signals from the mentee is a, a critical factor. And the way which we do it within Mowgli, as you asked me just now, is we run a four-day program. The first day is to allow the mentor to explore who he is authentically himself. And through that process, to actually come to like himself. And this is absolutely critical, because I guarantee you, and maybe you have had one, but I'd love to hear about it. Every mentor in your life is somebody you like or you love. I don't believe anybody has had a mentor they don't like. And if you don't like yourself, how can you expect somebody else to actually like you? So the first day is pulling back what we call the layers of filters that we put in our protection level in life. So you are able to work with yourself as an individual. The second day of the program is the art of mentoring. So we spend our time in role play so that people get attuned to what is mentoring and, and what things they should do and what things they should not do and how you bring out of a, a mentee those choices which he's thinking about and those choices which he might want to evaluate. Um, the third day is a, we introduce the entrepreneurs to the mentors for the first time. And during that day, we run a workshop all day. Of course, it, it's sort of an interesting subject. It's about entrepreneurship. But critically during that day, it's allowed an interplay to take place between the mentors and the mentees, such that at the end of the day of day three, the mentees are able to select which of those mentors they might like to be mentored by, and most importantly, which ones they do not want to be mentored by. Um, 
And this is a critical enabler because a mentee drives the relationship. It is the mentee who will reach out all the time. And therefore, the mentee must make the choice of who the mentor should be. Having done the selection process, which um, takes place at the end of day three, the mentor and mentee work during day four together on the business, the business challenges, the objectives of mentoring, and what their framework of cooperation is going to be. And then at the end of the day, there's a general presentation by all the entrepreneurs, and that, that starts the one-year process which we have in place. So that's how we do it. The last question you asked me, <laughs> amongst many, was how Mowgli started. Yep. And, and, I, and I go back to um, the time at, in Michigan Business School with C.K. Prahlad. At that time, when we had the students with C.K. Prahlad together, it was identified that money was no object. But the single biggest failure factor for entrepreneurs were they were not supported. And they were not supported during the most critical phase of an entrepreneur's journey, which is when they go through the startup. They're losing cash. They're not quite sure they're going to be business any longer. They eventually, they may jettison the project. They may pull out of the business too early. Um, and they need somebody to talk to because they can't go and tell their friends, I may be bankrupt next week. They can't say that to anybody. But they have to have a mentor who they can talk that through and what the, what the choices are, again, what the options are, what is the perspective on each of those options. Talk for a second about the stages um, at which it's critical to have a mentor in terms of the life cycle yeah, theory yeah. and at what points you need somebody. I've talked about the first one. Yeah. It is that phase during startup because unless you yourself have been through a startup phase, you would, would not understand how nerve wracking it can be, how you become insecure, how your mind starts to play games on you. Um, because you, failure, facing failure, is one of the biggest challenges of our life. So that's the first one. The second one is to go through growth. Um, you've, got, you've got stability, you've got, hopefully by that time, positive cash flows. And how do you grow the business? Um, typically, entrepreneurs need to find somebody else to help them in that process. Because at that point in time, you need to put in business processes, you need to put in organization, you need to bring in other people. You need to bring in talent development. And those might not be the right core skills that that entrepreneur has got. So who's going to tell the entrepreneur that he has to su succeed power to somebody else to lead his organization? It has to come from somebody like a mentor um, to facilitate that process. And then the third phase is when the entrepreneur becomes highly successful. He's probably got some wealth behind him now. His ego becomes inflated, he becomes arrogant, and he has at that point in time, which I've now called the Tiger Woods moment in his life, um, which he goes off the Richter scale in some way in terms of his behaviors. He needs somebody at that point in time to be able to, to bring him back down to reality. And if I use Tiger as a good example, because everyone knows about what happened, he has a, a very good mentor called Mark Amira. And Mark Amira, stopped mentoring Tiger in, 19, in 2006. And we were delighted to see that when he came back onto the Masters Golf Tournament in Augusta in April 2010, the first round of golf he had in public, he was playing with Mark Amira again. So his mentor was back with him. Fantastic. Okay. Let's see what we've got in terms of questions. Um, I think there's one particular one which um, we'll come back to. We need a few more questions, so anybody out there, please do feel free. But um, let's focus on failure, because um, on the one hand, mentoring is about avoiding f the risk of failure. But talk for a second about failure, accepting failure, and moving on. In coming up with a failure, you have to actually understand that there is a failure. And, and one of the hardest things in the world to do is to actually recognize that you have actually failed. And you should pull the plug on something, whatever that may be. Um, and that requires you to have a strength of character. You have to realize um, where, you're, where the business is at, 
or where the project is at, um, that it's really not worthwhile making any further investments in that particular project or that company. When you are in distress, that is tough because you're asking yourself to move outside your what I call comfort blanket of normal success. Um, once you've had the failure and you have recognized it, you, you then need to be able to take yourself away and look at what lessons you've learned. Um, I have not met anybody today who has been subjected to failure not to be a better person as a result of that failure, where they have learned from it. Where they have not learned from it, they have not become a better person. So failure is important to learn from. And for that perspective, it's worthwhile going through failure. Because when you look at the story of, of great entrepreneurs over the years, you will see failure as often as an intrinsic part of their development. And, and you'll find, for example, certain venture capitalists and private equity people will not invest with an entrepreneur who hasn't failed at least twice. So, absolutely. In fact, w when people ask us in Mowgli about your success ratios, um, we don't consider somebody who's been an entrepreneur failing as a failure. Because we would like to see that entrepreneur bounce back with another opportunity and become successful, or even fail the second time around, and then maybe on the third time around, he can be successful. So that failure enriches the future success rate. I think we've, we have talked before, but not today, no. about the hero's journey. And I think it's, it's really an interesting aspect. But the hero's journey is where somebody starts in what is called the ordinary world, and maybe he has a call to change. And 90% of the time, we re refuse that call. And it's usually a mentor who says to somebody, you're good enough to make that change. And so they now have an endorser into what they're trying to achieve. Having gone through that phase, they now cross the barrier line, as we call it, which means they're now going to put the phase of change into place. Once that has happened, they're under trial. Some people who were previously friends of theirs become enemies, and some people who were just acquaintances become true allies. And then they go through the storm of that change. They don't know where they're going to end up. For example, a startup, they're losing cash. Their business is not doing very well. When they come through that phase of what we call the storm, they then got, continue on their journey and hopefully, which comes back to the failure, because quite often they don't come through there with a successful outcome, they learn from it. And the more times you go around that journey, the greater your well of leadership commitment comes from. If I can just finish one thing there. Of course. Why is it that entrepreneurs become philanthropists? Because they're so grateful to have got out of these storms all the time that they want to give back. Because going through those storms is tra traumatic for them. Have you been through that cycle of storms yourself? Many times. Many times. Um, what would you like me to share with you? <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything that you can talk about. Any, I mean, I'm interested in the idea of um, how do you drive yourself through the storm? What's the focal point to get through it? At some point in time, you don't know what the focal point is. You just know there's a storm. Um, l let me give you two. Um, the first one is highly personal. So it comes back to your point about how mentoring actually helps you. Um, as you know, and some others do, my wife was diagnosed with MS in 1989. Um, and for MS people, it's a degrading disease. And you suddenly find your life as a husband and a partner completely changed overnight. How do you handle that? There's nobody out there to help you through that process. The doctors are all administering the care to the MS patient, not to the husband. H how do your children cope with it? Um, and that is, has, for us, as, as many people, was a really a difficult phase. And just to put a perspective, 85% of families 
where they have an MS patient get divorced. So only 15% make it through. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have a, a great mentor who was significantly able to give me, I go back, choices, perspective. Um, and he gave me a thing which I use at your Celebration Entrepreneurship event, which is what we call a happiness chart. And through that, and, and working with him for a period of six months, I was able to work out that actually how I go forward in terms of uh, through that storm. Um, I, I, th that's a personal one. In terms of the business, um, there have been a, a number. But the one I would bring to your attention most of all is that in 2004, the business was highly successful in all parameters of financial which you would use in a, a private equity firm, it was successful. Our customers were happy. But I made the comment at the board meeting that if I was an employee, I would resign. Because the business had started to suffocate me as a human being. The success was starting to suffocate me. Um, the pressures start of the family pressure of the family with the, my wife with MS, and the business succeeding suffocated me. And I went to a mentor again. How do I get out of this storm? Um, and they gave me choices. Again, I, uh, choice number one, close the business, take the cash. Choice number two, bring in a new management team and lead a change program. Choice number three, sell it. Um, perspective on all those three, we chose to go into a change management program and bring a, a new management team in. Um, as it turned out, that was not the best option, only because the chief executive got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. But I could not have foreseen that at that moment in time. But the mentor helped me through that storm. And there are many more as well. So what's the skill in knowing the moment to find or pick the phone up or engage with the mentor? If I go back, to, I said to you earlier, I've got 14 mentors in my life, six of who I'm currently working with. And when I say currently working with, they are relationships with people who are friends of mine. So it's not a physical working. I always keep in touch with them. Um, I, I had a particular issue earlier this year, which um, I needed help on. So I, I understand what I'm needing now and what I need to have in preparation before. Because um, I'm looking at what the outcome is. Um, I need to achieve that outcome. How do I get there? I need to have those choices. I, I keep on going back and harping choices of decision making. And I reach out to them for, to hear what their choices are. And quite often you get, amongst say three or four different mentors, a, a number saying the same things to you as choices. So that gives you like a, a, a confirmation. Those are real live ones. Um, but you have to reach out. And what, one thing I would say is that people do not have a successful mentor relationship if they don't continue to reach out and nourish, by the way, that relationship. Because the mentor must get something back from the mentee as much as the mentee gets from the mentor. And just, um, I'll ask a question and then move over to the screen to try and um, get some questions. But before that, what are the characteristics of a successful entrepreneur? Because I think a lot of this is around kind of, um, you know, limiting uh, weakness and consolidating your strength, etc., and finding ways of, uh, of growing and developing. What are the characteristics, in your opinion, of all the entrepreneurs you've met? What's, what are the f three or four or five things that are common traits, if you can say, if you can define them? Quite often when you see an entrepreneur who's been successful, you will not actually attribute insecurity because they're now polished and external. But actually, when they started off as an entrepreneur, they will have been insecure. That's number one. Number two, they've got to have persistence. They've got to continue going on and on to achieve their goal. Um, and that persistence in adversity is a critical component. O entrepreneurs are a very strange breed. They've usually got a chip on their shoulder. 
And if they've got a chip on one shoulder, they've got a chip on both shoulders, and that makes them look balanced. But most fundamentally important about them is that they're what I call data-driven. And what I mean by that is they look at their marketplace and they collect the data all the time on their market. They really understand their market. They're not relying upon gut reaction all the time. They have a really good feel through data collection and understanding the marketplace. And they're, they're not risk takers. Everyone talks about risk taking. They're risk mitigators. They look through the options and they mitigate their risk. Now, later on in life, when they have been successful, they become risk takers. And then they go, um, when they start off, they're usually risk mitigators. Which is a different perspective. It is, it's true. Because you get at that, you get, I mean, that's a perennial debate, isn't it? Is the entrepreneur a, a perennial risk taker or is the entrepreneur a risk mitigator? When he starts out and he's got very little in terms of financial resources, whatever resources, he will guard those resources very carefully and he'll guard them through risk mitigation. When his resources, either corporately, he, he will change the game, he'll start placing bets. I'll, I'll take a bet in this succeeding over here, I'll take a bet over this succeeding. And he'll spread, like a portfolio, his risks. Okay? But still, he will always be data-driven. He'll be collecting market data, which is leading him to make decisions. And does the mentor have to be successful to be a good mentor? The mentor has to be successful in mentoring. He does not have to be successful in terms of being an entrepreneur. He can be su a, a, someone who's not successful in a, a, a business, um, and he, he can mentor, providing he has the attributes I mentioned earlier. But ideally, he's got success as well as the attributes. So that's important as well, because a successful mentor is not necessarily someone to default towards. You know, the, the, the risk, of course, is going to the guy who's successful because that's the default. If he's successful, he must be a good mentor. He can teach me. Good mentors will put the interest of the mentee at, at heart. He does not have to be a successful entrepreneur to be a good mentor of an entrepreneur. Um, he just has to be able to come back again and again, I keep on saying it, choices and perspective on those choices. And to get the entrepreneur who is mentoring out of his box of thinking into a new box where he's got more options to choose from. Talk for a second, Tony, about the, the shape of the region in terms of the differences in entrepreneurial behavior across the region as you see it and the needs of entrepreneurs as they vary by country, if at all. Let me give you a generic, first of all, of the entrepreneurship space within the Middle East. Uh, the origins of people who have been successful within the Middle East as businessmen um, has been their ability to maintain key relationships with key decision makers. And through that process, they have gathered their businesses together. Um, and that's been a traditional model. And if you look at certain countries in the Middle East today, you'll see that that model has anywhere between 70 and 90% of the economy. Um, so the entrepreneur today, in order for him to be successful, and, and if he doesn't have those relationships, he has a really tough task to break into that marketplace. So let's just use one example in Jordan today. Um, over 50% of the business placed in Jordan is by the government. And when the government plays a contract, you have to have a bid bond and you have to have a performance bond. And the contracts are large. There's no SMEs who can play in that space. So that business is out for them from day one. So for an entrepreneur to be successful, he has to find niches where that is not required, where he can grow his business to such a size that he can then compete later on. And that's a challenge. To answer your question now in terms of Pacific areas, um, and I think you're asking the question, where, is, where are the heartland of entrepreneurial spirit today? Um, the Lebanese are fantastic entrepreneurs. They, they almost uh, have it within them um, when they're born. But actually, the, the best entrepreneurs today are coming out of Gaza. Um, what, what's that expression? Necessity is mother invention. Mm. Um, 
And they are really stretching the envelope of entrepreneurship in, in a fantastic way. Unfortunately, if we look at Syria, the, the entrepreneurial flame it, it exists, but the infrastructure to support the entrepreneurs in Syria needs to be significantly developed in terms of capacity development. Um, in Jordan, it's a, it, there's a very lively, particularly in the information technology area, a, a lively business in entrepreneurship. Um, Egypt has a nascent entrepreneurial activity, but it's had many years of what I would call bureaucratic delays in, in moving forward. So is it possibly successful in the Middle East as an entrepreneur? Yes, it is. Is it harder to be successful in the Middle East than it is somewhere else, like in Europe and America? Absolutely. And what more can be done to encourage entrepreneurship? I mean, mentoring is obviously one critical facet. What do you think are the other components of ensuring entrepreneurial success and long term? I think the first... Keep talking, feel free. I'm going to check the computer. No, no, worry about I, think, me. I, think, I think the first major issue is that the economic structures within the countries have to allow entrepreneurs to be successful. So you cannot have monopolies governing major areas of the business. I think this, the second one has to come within the financing, finance area. Entrepreneurs need access to capital. Um, in many of the countries, you can only get access to finance if you have collateral, which means you've already got capital. Most of the entrepreneurs do not have that. As a result of that, they're unable to finance their working capital. Um, and whilst they say there's SME finance, that SME finance is available for people who've got capital, either in property or cash. So finance is a second area. I, th I think the third area is building ecosystems around for them so that these people are able to be challenged intellectually in what they're doing, to be challenged in terms of uh, how they can develop their businesses. And for that, there are a number of bodies today helping them in that process. Um, and, and mentoring, by the way, is one of those ecosystem players which should be helping those entrepreneurs. There's a great question here, actually. Um, do, uh, this is a question which is, do you depend on business mentors other than your angel investors? That's a good question because often the angel investor can become the mentor. So how do you, do you default to the angel or do you, do you find somebody else? Well, if you have an angel investor who's invested in your business, is he mentoring you to protect his investment or is he mentoring you for your benefit? So in my view, whilst you should listen to your angel investor, you need to get somebody who's putting your interests at the center and not maybe his conflicted interest of being an investor with you. So mentoring is fundamentally about you, your potential, your motivation, getting you through. Absolutely. Not the business per se. Correct. And, 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 let, right. me, and let me show you a good example. Yeah. Um, I can't talk about the business, but we have a, a mentee who was left the business by her husband dying. And she's now the de facto CEO running the business. She has no passion for the business whatsoever. And our advice to her is create the business over the next year or so in, in a way which allows you to flog it next year. Now, if you were an investor, would you be giving that advice? Maybe not. But since she has no passion for it, and looking at her interest specifically, that's the advice you give. So that's a, an example of where there's a, a direct conflict between an investor position and a mentoring position. Absolutely. Let me just grab another question here. Um, great. How many mentors, is there an optimal number of people to, met, to, to be your mentor? I said earlier I've got six at this moment in time, and 14 over my lifetime. Do they know each other? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I have the pleasure of having my 60th birthday next year, and they're all invited. 
So they, they all know each other. They've known each other for some time. So um, uh, definitely, o optimal number. That's, that's a great question. I've never thought about an optimal number. I would say to you it is impossible to have more than three mentors actively engaged on an issue. So therefore what I'm saying is you can have a pool of mentors, and I have six at the moment in time, but actually on a specific issue, which I have, I probably never engage more than three. Does that help answer the question? Uh, yeah. I mean, sure. so, so I'm saying you almost like have a panel of mentors. Yeah. Okay. And for a particular issue you've got, you go to the panel that you think is going to give you the best advice in. And talk about the age of mentors. To be a mentor, do you have to be more experienced than the person you're mentoring? or? Not at all. Um, you can learn, which is what this is about at the end of the day, an awful lot for people who are younger than you. And I, I mentioned earlier, I think that my daughter is a mentor, a mentor to me. She is a fantastic critic of mine. She gives me fantastic feedback all the time. Um, what kind of feedback? Um, quote unquote, you're too harsh on people, Tony. <laughs> okay, let that person get more space. Let them prosper a little bit more before you come to a judgment. Um, when, when, I, when I'm making uh, a, a presentation, you didn't come out clearly, Tony, on this point and this point, which were key to your, so I, I'll get that feedback. Um, and not, not only her, by the way, but I find many younger generation can give you a completely different perspective. And I've come back time and time again today and said choices and perspective. They have a different perspective on an issue. Listen to them. So age doesn't make you definitely a, a, a mentor, I through experience. Are there any great mentoring regional case studies so far? Because, of course, the thing that we all want to try and get to is, is examples where we can show entrepreneurs the success of a certain method are, are there models that you can think of that work within in the Middle East yeah not yet I, I have not seen one um, uh, within the Europe and America there are many where whenever you hear of an entrepreneur or a key sportsman these days you'll always hear about his mentor and, and how that mentor was really engaging with them and led to their success. Um, we have a few in the Middle East who are successful entrepreneurs. We probably don't hear enough about the mentors that led them to that success. And that is a, maybe a, an issue with culture in the Middle East. Um, but not yet, unfortunately. But that's obviously... We, we hope to write the first few. Of course. Yeah. Because that's obviously a key component of... Um of proof of, of what Mowgli is doing, of course. Correct. So let's move a little bit, let's move on a bit. I, do, do you see, you know, what kind of entrepreneurs does, is the region developing right now? Is there a trend, even post Egypt, etc.? Are you seeing any change in the kind of entrepreneur behavior and the kind of areas that people are getting into of business? I'm not sure there's a correlation. But what I would say to you is that over the last three months, we've actually seen a higher quality of entrepreneur wanting to be mentored on the Mowgli programs. So if I benchmark our programs done last year, and our last three programs, the quality of the entrepreneur in general has been higher. Whether that's because of changes taking place, I wouldn't like to comment. Um, the types of entrepreneur have been in the information technology business. We've had quite a few in what I would call the agricultural business come through recently. Um, quite a few in terms of, uh, let's put it, consulting bracket as well. So yeah, they're, they're coming through. Um, but it's really the quality which has improved. And the quality in terms of their ability and attitude to be successful. Is a mentor a teacher, or not necessarily? Yes. A mentor is a teacher. Teaching is part of it. In fact, uh, um, one of my great mentors says you've always, in life, you need great teachers and great mentors. And with that, you'll have a rich life.
And to what extent do you need a mentor to be physically existing or, or can you almost learn by example from what you read and from what you observe? Can a mentor be a mentor without necessarily knowing that he's a mentor to someone? That's a bit of an abstract question, but... Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> can I be a mentor to somebody and, they don't, and I don't know it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I thought you were going to say to me, if you'd never met them. Right. I don't think you can be a mentor to somebody um, uh, without meeting them. But I guess you can learn by example. Having said that, let, 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 let's just think about that. Um, I, I think we've learned something, all of us have learned, from Nelson Mandela. Right. I have never met him. Right. Okay. Um, Mahatma Gandhi. Yeah. I, I never met him. Um, so you, I think you can find from their, the way they live their lives. From the life journey. The life journey. Um, from what's written about them, the way they are. Um, you, you can learn definite things from them. Um, definitely. Because that's a big and, industry, and that, isn't it? It's a big correct. book publishing industry around life lessons from other people and applying, you know, X, Y, Z's philosophy to business, yeah. applying the art of war to corporate behavior, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. What do you think of all that industry? <laughs> um, in the main, it's not talking about the human being. It's talking about how they've achieved things in that corporate. I mean, for let, let's use an example in the financial sector. There's books like Liars Poker, and The, the Big Short, etc. Um, I, I wouldn't have thought you'd learned an awful lot about mentoring in those books. <laughs> um, but I think uh, autobiographies. If you actually believe what's written, I think you can actually learn quite a bit from them. Because we all have a quest. Okay. I think the whole nature of biography is a quest to try and learn through the story of someone else's life and how you might be able to apply it to yourself. Absolutely. Um, but I think certain figures stand out. I mean, the third one is Mother Teresa, um, because the way she lived her life and the way she, she, she has become um, before she died. So I think. You definitely can, through the, those key people, absolutely learn a lot. Um, and watching people. And what can the business community do to, to really um, to drive the mentoring, availability of mentors? Because, you know, we're all busy doing our stuff, and generally speaking, being a mentor to somebody is not a high priority. So what can, what can a business person do to, to free up the, the bandwidth to do it? Our definition of leadership development is very simple. It is to serve is to lead. So if you serve somebody, they will follow you and you have become a leader. Um, and there is no greater service than you can provide to another human being than to mentor them. So for us, at the very core of leadership development is the ability for one human being to mentor another as part of the leadership development. Now, within the corporate sector, which is the uh, sector you're addressing, um, that is critical for their own ability to l get good leaders within their organization. And for those good leaders to then mentor their people. Um, so it should be of interest to all corporates, including a branch capital. And just as an example, um, can you talk, well, I'm interested in what, what Mowgli is doing in terms of its regional plan and how you see yourself playing that mentoring, mentee role going forward in the next five or ten years. I, I think one of the key attributes is that up until now, most of our mentors have come from outside the region. But on the last three programs we ran, which was 30 people in total, uh, we actually were able to recruit within the region 50% from Lebanon and from Jordan. So we are taking people internally now within the Middle East onto our mentoring programs as mentors. Of course, all of our entrepreneurs have come from within the region. So that, that's nothing new. Our plan is going forward. It, we are now moving ahead with programs in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Palestine. Syria, we currently have programs pending until such time as it's suitable and convenient to go back into Syria and mentor. 
um, and the new territory which will open up this year is Egypt, um, particularly after what's happened and the quest for entrepreneurship within that country. It's, it's a really key issue for us to address. So those, were, And then the, the occasional other program which will be built around a specific need of a specific organization. Talk for a second about something we've been working on together, if you can, which is um, we've been cooking up for WAMDA yeah. uh, a platform around online mentoring. Talk for a second, if you can, Tony, about the vision around that and what we're trying to achieve together on that. Yeah. For those on the call who have um, not been informed of what you've been talking about, it's, it's a project called Mentor Match in which we will be ha having a, a system where mentors can register their interest. There will be profiles of mentors. Entrepreneurs and mentees will be able to register their interest with a profile of the, of the mentee. And there's a matchmaking between the two parties who want to engage in a mentoring relationship. And our objective here is to become, whereas our current Mowgli program is a tailor-made specific program of training the mentor, um, matchmaking one-on-one -on -one, uh, process. Yep. This project is almost to take that whole concept, if I could use the word, to the masses. So anybody who comes online can get access to a mentor. They can evaluate the mentors available online. They can reach out to those mentors online and they can engage with those mentors through a process which we've put into Mentor Match. And likewise, a mentor can look at what mentees he might want to engage with. And hopefully that will come online sometime be before Absolutely. the end, end of we'll summer. We'll be announcing the beta of that in yeah. due course. And so what and we're looking uh, for is people to sign up as soon as it comes online. Mentors to sign up and mentees to sign up um, and, and start their journey together. And talk for a second, Tony, about your experience of the, the celebration of entrepreneurship because you know, what we tried to do there, of course, was to, to put everyone together and create this energy around two and a half thousand people being in the same room, literally, with 220 speakers, stroke quasi-mentors talking to them. Yeah. What was your experience of that, that scale? I'll quote what I've quoted everywhere in the world. I have never been to an event where there was so much energy over two days of that event. Um, it was wonderful to see everybody engaging without any boundaries, whether that be hierarchical, whether that be nationality, whether that would be uh, male, female. There was complete diversity and complete integration. Okay. And what was laid on then was mentoring sessions. I, I can't remember the number, but I think it's sort of like 640 mentoring sessions took place during that day. 640? It was taking place, which was fantastic. Um, we ourselves put on a mentoring workshop for 95 people in a room for one hour. And in that one hour, 95 people acted as a mentor and 95 people were mentored. So within that one hour space, it, it was truly phenomenal. Truly phenomenal. And um, do, you, do you see, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, and I, I have to share with you, that yeah. at the end of the event, on the Wednesday morning, I was supposed to fly to Doha. I couldn't get out of bed. I was absolutely cream crackered. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was, it was a great, night. great two days, great two days. Fantastic. Of positive energy. So we'll talk in due course, we'll, we'll talk about the, um, the plans we have for that. Mm -hmm. Who do you see as, um, you know, in terms of where Mowgli sits in the value chain? Because obviously you talked about ecosystem, and ecosystem is really about everybody working together in this kind of harmonious way. Who are the other important components, and who are the organizations that you think are critical, or the types of organizations to make yeah. this whole, whole thing happen? Because we can't do it by ourselves, of course. In jazz, really are taking this out to the schools. Um, and they're making people aware of it and giving them work experience, etc., which, which is phenomenal. Once they have a startup, you have the, the incubators, which are nurturing them in various different ways. And we see there being two models of the mentoring. The first one is the Mowgli model, which I've outlined. But the second one is Endeavor. And, and what Endeavor are trying to bring 
is for those high impact entrepreneurs, if I call it the, 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 the highly selected ones, they will provide a really intensive package of mentoring around that individual to lead that person to greater success. Um, and so we look forward to the day, by the way, which a Mowgli graduate who's been through our year program then becomes a, an Endeavor mentee. Um, that, that would be something to be cherished, by the way, going forward. And, and we are in discussion with Endeavor for them to be put forward through their normal process. Um, and talk for a second, but, yeah. But I think there's, a, there's something which we haven't talked about, which is education. Yeah. Many people are saying to me today, <clears throat> the key to success within the Middle East is to get education. I couldn't agree more. But that education is going to be of children today. We already have a massive population who are age 21 plus, And we have to cater for their needs. And the only way in which we're going to reach out to those people is through mentoring and further education. I talk for a second, Tony, about um, the people who've gone through the system in the region already. What's the kind of feedback you've got? What's the profile of entrepreneurs and how have they evolved, benefited, and where, where do you want to take it? 85% of our mentor-mentee relationships have continued into the second year outside our official program. So they're continuing. Um, the second part of the delightful news is that um, more than 75% of the entrepreneurs have lasted beyond one year. As in the business has lasted? As in the business lasted. Um, and why that figure is, I think, slightly low is in a number of cases that they, they haven't failed as an entrepreneur. They've actually gone back into business, into an employment. Right. And, and put their business on, on the back burner um, for, for security reasons. They weren't quite competent enough to break through. Um, so that, 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 those are the two real key messages. 85% are continuing to be mentored. And to what extent is it useful to have a corporate career before you become an entrepreneur? Because, you know, there's that whole notion around, you know, entrepreneurs are born versus made and so forth. Um, if I'm an entrepreneur, if I'm, if I'm, if I've got an entrepreneurial focus and I'm 20 or 21 years old, is it better for me to work for a few years and then become an entrepreneur or do I take the risk, you know, at college age and later? I'm, a, I'm an advocate of the 10,000 hour rule, which is that you need to learn that business by spending 10,000 hours. And um, there's a great book which you may have read called The Outliers. Yeah. Okay. And he talks about the 10,000 hour rule. So a pilot, for example, before he gets to a certain level, has done 10,000 hours. And the quoted example in Malcolm Gladwell's book, of course, is the Beatles. And they did their 10,000 hours in Hamburg before they came back to Liverpool. So I think rather than saying a corporate environment, I think they have to spend 10,000 hours to really understand that business, which they then take on to become entrepreneurial. So there's no prerequisite to have no. to be in a corporate career, etc. No. No. Let me just. But they have to spend 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours doing something that takes them to that No, 10,000 hours learning the business. Let me just very quickly check. Are we, how are we doing? We're nearly there. We're nearly wrapping up, Tony, if I can just take up a bit more of your time. To what extent, um, there's a good question here, to what extent do you need to be a mentor as an employer? What extent to be a mentor as an employer? If that's saying, if that's asking, should every employer be a mentor, which is the other way I look at it, um, I don't believe you can lead without being a mentor. So if you're saying a leader is an employer, then you have to be a mentor. Now, there are different leadership organization structures which are maybe built around maybe a dictatorial model or an autocratic model in which mentoring would not be part of that process. I understand that. But that may be suboptimal. It might be fine for the short term, but if you want to see that organization growing and developing and continuing in a sustainable way for a long period of time, you need to have mentoring at the heart of leadership and therefore mentoring it as part of an employer. Fantastic. Thank you, Tony. I think okay. we're out of time.
Okay. It's passed pretty quickly, but um, we'd love to have you back again, maybe in a few months' time, talking about Mowgli, talking about the programming, and talking more about the region and um, where it's heading. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you.